um, people are starting to come in now. We're just one, one or two more minutes and uh, we'll go ahead and get started. We've seen with a lot of these webinars, um, people need to update their Zoom or, or get connected, find the link, et cetera. So we'll start just shortly. Thank you for waiting and thanks for joining. Just one more minute and then we'll go ahead and get started and we can let people uh, continue to join during my introduction. Um, so first off, uh, thank you everybody for joining me. It'd be great just to see in the uh, chat if you know how to find it. If you could just let me know, can you hear me and uh, can you see my presentation on the screen? Uh, perfect, thank you. Oh, this is great. A very engaged group today. <laughs> I'm going to go ahead and get started. So um, we know that this is going to be a slightly smaller um, webinar than some of the ones that we've we've recently run. And I think actually in some ways that's going to give us more scope for some discussion and unmuting at the end. And so we'll see how that goes. So thank you uh, for answering my questions already. And, and please continue to engage uh, as we go forward. Hopefully a few more will join us. Um, but I'll go ahead and, and get started. So this is this is the third webinar that the KTN Microbiome Special Interest Group has put on. And these webinars um, were created really to give the community a place to share and give updates while we are unable to attend conferences and meet in person. Um, so first off, today's program, um, I'm gonna just briefly run through the webinar guidelines. I'm going to give an introduction to KTN and what the microbiome special interest group is. And then we will get to hear from David, uh, who will tell us a little bit more about magnitude biosciences. So first off, um, all of you will see that you've been muted as you've entered um, and your videos off. If for some reason the technology fails and allows you to share things, we'd ask you that you don't just to, to keep things moving smoothly. Um, at the end, I'm going to try to allow questions to be taken via voice as well as chat. I know some people are not comfortable unmuting themselves, that's okay. Um, but what we'll do is, is you'll see in the participants tab uh, a little green check for yes. If you click the green check, um, I, I will select you to, uh, I'll unmute you, sorry, and give you the option to ask questions and, and have a bit more of a discussion with David. Finally, if you're having technical issues, um, go ahead, let us know over chat. I can't promise we'll be able to help you, but we might be able to. Uh, Sasha from the KTN is in here with me, so she'll do her best to try to answer your questions. And finally, just to let everybody know, this webinar is being recorded, and there has been quite an appetite for the, the recorded webinars. So if you are having kind of uh, worse technical issues, you should be able to access it online afterwards. So I'm gonna just tell you a little bit more about KTN and um, the Microbiome Special Interest Group before we hear from David. So um, KTN, uh, we consider ourselves the UK's network of networks. We are primarily grant funded by Innovate UK, which is part of the UKRI, which is the UK's research councils. They have about a 400 million pound a year budget to support companies to undertake innovative R&D. Um, we have over 160 sex sector experts um, 
sorry, we have 160 sector experts supporting our, our network of over 160,000 contacts. Um, so across many of the companies in the UK, and we have specialists working across all areas, ranging from health and agri-food to robotics, AI and sensors. And so a lot of the value that we bring is to bring people together across these different sector areas um, to innovate at the interface. And so I've added a little bit more information. If you've seen the previous webinars, I was asked to provide more as to what KTN is. And so I won't read everything, but again, these slides will be available for you to take a closer look afterwards. Um, and so, so at KTN, uh, because of our relationship with Innovate UK, our aims are to increase business-led R&D, um, to facilitate the exploitation of that R&D. And of course, um, those of you who know us is to, to also encourage collaboration between both businesses as well as businesses and the research base. Um, and just to say, I, I think especially this, the second checkpoint there that says that we are impartial and trusted is key um, because we are, are government funded and not associated, I guess, uh, more closely with any single company. Um, that has been one of our greatest strengths. So how do we help companies? Um, we help them through partnering. As I said, um, access to funding is kind of one of our major uh, functions. And so we, we help people access Innovate UK funding. For those of you who are UK companies listening now, you, you may be aware that we're waiting to hear more about 750 million pounds of grant and other funding to be distributed through Innovate UK to help with, um, with essentially response to uh, coronavirus and continuing to operate. So keep an eye on that over the next couple of weeks and reach out if you have questions when that is announced. We organize events um, both in person and webinars um, we do site visits with companies in the UK to kind of uh, work with them to see how we can help. And we get engaged in strategic work. And, and that's where the special interest group falls. But we also do things like roadmaps and run international missions for the UK government. Um, and I, I won't go through this slide, but just to say um, this kind of highlights uh, some of the, the outputs and why companies work with us. And, and just to kind of focus in on a couple of the points is that businesses that we work with have reported on average more than a um, hundred million pound per year increase in investment in R&D. Um, so that's, that's both grant as well as their internal expenditure. And I think the one that we're really proud of is two thirds of companies introduced by the KTN go on to collaborate oftentimes um, to access Innovate UK funding. So I mentioned special interest groups and, and that's what this uh, webinar is part of. And the KTN runs special interest groups which essentially support areas of high potential where the UK has a capability and or a capacity to succeed um, through community building and strategic work. And these areas are often areas where, again, we see this capability or capacity, but we are not seeing the kind of commercial activity or outputs that we would expect are possible. And so the microbiome was identified as one of these areas. And, and last November, we launched what is the microbiome special interest group. And just to tell you a little bit more about what our goals are, the, the KTN's microbiome special interest group is um, there to especially build a proactive and self-sustaining microbiome community in the UK. Um, and that is both virtual, you know, now more so than ever, but as well as is face-to-face -face events and networking. Um, and these events, while they are focused more on the UK, are open for everybody to participate in and contribute in. Because um, we do understand it is an international community and, and the UK working with the international community is just as beneficial as it working with um, other UK partners. We want to raise the profile of the activity in the UK. So both the world leading basic research as well as some of the industrial and commercial activity um, to make it easier for partners to find each other for investors to see what's happening and in, in general to increase the amount of activity. Um, we are very keen on increasing the number of microbiome spin-outs and startups, as well as helping to create an environment that supports their transition into scale-ups. Um, we know that, that um, having a very active uh, SME community, um, startups, uh, spin-outs, et cetera, helps everybody involved. Um, and then finally, we, we want to inform the UK government um, from both a policy and investment standpoint where relevant um, and and we're doing this currently 
uh, through the creation of a strategic roadmap, which we have um, a, a great advisory board um, with 11 work streams and, and many, many people involved. And we hope to have that done kind of in the fall. So, so that's just an overview. Get in touch if you have more questions. We have a website there at the bottom. And again, these slides will be available, so you'll be able to find that. Um, otherwise, if you have any questions, comments, or if there's anything you want to see, get in touch with myself or, or Andrew Morgan, who's been our incredible chair, who's, who's really uh, making all of this possible. Um, and as I say, this is a, a community activity. So if you have other ideas for webinars, anything that you want to see or feel like um, you just want to have a conversation, please do get in touch. Um, so that is the end for me. And I'm going to stop sharing my screen and pass it over to David, who's going to share his. And he's going to tell you about magnitude biosciences. Great. Thank, thank you, Charles. Um, I'll just get my screen shared. Great. And we can hear you very well, David. Brilliant. <laughs> OK. Um, well, thank you, everybody, for um, attending this webinar. I, I know there's a lot of uh, online events out there and it's really not that easy to find the time to, to attend these. So I I'm, I'm really appreciate your time and hopefully you'll find this of interest. I know that there's, I can see from recognizing some of the names on the participant list as people from maybe many different sectors. So some of this will you know, there'll be different things for different people, but um, hopefully we can have a little bit of discussion. I'll try and get through it, um, try and get through it to give us enough time. So this, this um, talk, so Magnitude Biosciences is a, is, a, is a relatively new company. It's a spin out of Durham University and it provides research services um, with the using the nematode C. elegans. But also my own personal research as, as an associate professor at Durham University is actually to do with the bacteria and, and health and how that fits in with the microbiome. So, so, this, so, so this talk is kind of a merger of my academic work and our work on magnitude biosciences and hopefully trying to bring this all together and really able to help the microbiome industry. I met Andrew at a workshop at the beginning of March in the days when there still were workshops and um, and we had a really good discussion and, I and hopefully that you know we can find a way where we can fit into the to the UK microbiome industry. So what I'm going to talk to you about is the potential value of the C. elegans bacteria media interaction model I'm going to talk about an example from my own research and how we've shown that inhibiting bacterial folate synthesis reduces toxicity without slowing growth and has an effect on aging. I'll talk to you a little bit about magnitude biosciences and how we operate and what we can do. And then, you know, show, try and show you how we could potentially help the microbiome field by act, identifying active bacterial molecules and such and looking for things such as biomarkers, potential drugs, or novel targets. So my background is in the field of aging. And, you know, one of the key questions of the aging research field is not how to live longer, but how to maintain health with increased age. Now this is, you know, aging is very complex. There's a multifactorial problem that will probably take more, many interventions to really be able to achieve that increased health. Um, aging is a massive risk factor though for many diseases and that's really been hammered home uh, with COVID-19 but you know obviously many other chronic diseases but the FDA won't approve drugs to slow aging itself so that means that the drug development field can't develop something directly for aging it has to be some other condition and I think that's the way that many biotech companies are going. Now as you all know um, in um, the gut microbiota has strong links with health and disease. And the other thing about it is it's accessible to manipulation. It, it, you know, we, can, we can affect our diet, we can swallow things. So in that respect, that's what, what's what I mean by it's accessible to interventions. However, in terms of the way that the pharmaceutical industry works, it doesn't really fit the normal models where they will normally find a specific target um, with a mechanism by how that works and then, and then address that. It's much harder in the microbiome because we've got so many different microbes, so many different genes involved. 
uh, it's not really always clear how those things are affecting health. And, and obviously there's been masses of work in this field uh, and many different approaches which are starting to understand that, but it's still, I think a major challenge, which means that the pharmaceutical industry, big pharma is, is kind of watching this field, but not necessarily getting involved as much as it, as it can be. And I think that some of the things that many of us are doing um, can maybe help that. So C. elegans is a small nematode about a millimeter long, and it's been very su successful in the understanding of many things about fundamental biology. There's three Nobel Prizes have been won by people working with things in C. elegans. Um, they have many genes in common with, with, with humans, and they, and they age fast. Their lifespan is three weeks, and we found you know, they slow down within one week, so they're very easy to, to work with. They, they also maintained, oh, sorry, they also maintained on the a lawn of bacteria, and that bacteria has grown on some media. Oh dear, oh dear, my, this happens to me all the time, sorry. Um, so the other thing about C. elegans, and this is a, a great slide um, borrowed from Barris Tursen. Um, he, he has shown, you know, he's got these pictures, this is a, a picture that really illustrate how, how C. elegans, although they're a tiny nematode, have many of the features of, of human biology, you know, the, the basics, neurons, muscles, intestine, epidermis, excretory system, and the germline. So there's our, um, obviously, there's obviously many similar, many differences, but many similarities. It is really a good animal model. And what I'm trying to show you is that there's multiple ways that we can manipulate this system. We can manipulate the worm itself through genetics or drugs. We can manipulate the bacteria through genetics and drugs, and we can affect, and we can manipulate that the media by by changing the composition of that media. And I'm going to show you a quick example of of of, of how we've done that um, to understand um, how bacterial photosynthesis affects aging in C. elegans. So, uh, so this is for those who don't know what a worm lab looks like. This is me. A few years ago, as you can see my hair color, um, showing that you can pick these worms um, from the agar. This is me doing this blind, that's why it's a bit shaky. And then you can put it down onto a, um, a lawn of bacteria and the worm sw swims off and is eating this bacteria. And that's kind of how we do experiments, just to, so you get an idea of what, what we do. So. An observation that I made many years ago now in, in um, David Jem's lab at UCL was that a spontaneous mutation in the E. coli that we grow the C. elegans on makes the worm live a lot longer. I was using it, there's a, there's a mechanism that you can use in C. elegans where you can knock out genes using RNA interference by making the worms eat E. coli that expresses double-stranded RNA for the gene of choice. And we were using that to try and identify some genes involved in aging. And I found one of these strains made the worms live a lot longer, but it was nothing to do with the RNAi. It was actually to do with a spontaneous mutation in the E. coli genome. And I won't go into, you can, it's published, you can understand that, but I won't even have to find that out. But we found that it was, a, it was mutated in the gene ARRO-D, which is in the shikimic acid pathway, which makes aromatic amino acids and other aromatic compounds. And the aromatic compound that turned out to be the most important was paraminobenzoic acid or PABA, which is a pre, sorry, which is a, oh, sorry, which is a precursor of folate. My, my, sorry, my mouse keeps moving around. And um, that, um, sorry, it keeps jumping. And then if, you, if you put PABA back in the media, it shortens the lifespan again. And, we can also found that we can inhibit this pathway using a, a sulfonamide drug that competes with PABA um, and it inhibits photosynthesis. And, and, we, and the, the drug affects the bacteria. So this, these three uh, circles are supposed to represent the media, the bacteria and the animal. So if we inhibit photosynthesis in the bacteria, we can make the in, we could cause an increase in the mean lifespan and it's a relatively linear increase with a low concentration of the drug. So the folate cycle is very complex and it's basically used for biosynthesis 
of, of key building blocks of, of life, such as nucleic acids and amino acids and so on. Um, but the folates are kind of um, working in an enzymatic way as cofactors for, for several enzymes. Uh, and so they, they're a cycle and they get, re, they get recycled. So actually the folates themselves are not needed um, very much, but what they do is they shuttle one carbon molecule through this to, 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 for biosynthesis. Now, folates are very important for human health, but animals can't make folates. Um, so we, we require this uh, folates from our diet and from our gut microbes. So a simplified version of the folate cycle shows that you have these, you know, a couple of interlinked cycles that allow the, the, the synthesis of pyrimidines, purines, and also the methionine cycle causes the synthesis of s adenosyl methionine, which is a donor for all methylation reactions. Now, what we think is going on when we inhibit folate synthesis in our system is that we're not doing enough to stop growth. We're just bringing down the amount of folate. So one way of thinking about it is so we've still got the cycle, but it's a kind of a thinner cycle than, than it was before. And, and so we find that there's no effect on growth and no effect on colony forming units of this bacteria. But, and then when we look at the worm, and this is a little video of a worm moving behind there, you see that though the, the worm folate levels are reduced quite a lot, they doesn't have any effect on growth and reproduction. Saying that there is still enough folate in the system to allow the, the animal and the bacteria to grow normally. Now the question was, was this folate important in the bacteria or the animal? And as I could spend a lot of time talking about that, but to, to cut a long story short, we found that it was most important in the bacteria and not in the animal. We could supplement back the animal using folinic acid uh, and, 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 and we used a folate deficiency model of C. elegans to test that. And we found that we still could see that the, 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 the animal um, had an increased lifespan. So, you know, in a kind of very crude way, Animal folate is good, bacterial folate is bad, except that it's not necessary. We don't think bacterial folate itself is toxic. We think that bacterial folate is required for some, some other thing that's, that accelerates aging. So one of the things that we could do was that um, there's a, 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 collect, a key collection of, a, a, of, of all the viable single gene mutations of E. coli um, that, was, that was made, the Keo collection, and we use that to screen over a thousand mutants of E. coli to find other genes that might influence lifespan of C. elegans. And we did four rounds of testing. I can't really have time to go for the details, but we found nine E. coli mutants that extended C. elegans lifespan robustly. And two of those were involved in folate synthesis directly. That's PAB-A and PAB-B used to make PABA, as I, uh, which, which is, as I said before, is a pre precursor to folate. And so, and we could rescue that by putting the genes back in. So, so that um, sort of showed that we were right about folate synthesis, but we were hoping that this screen would tell us more about how C, uh, E. coli affected C. elegans. And we found some other genes that were quite interesting, but they didn't exactly directly tell us how, how they worked. And we're working on how those, those genes work. One, one thing we did find that there wasn't, any strong correlation between the mutation's um, ability to expect lifespan and, the, and, the, and their growth rates. And so we don't think that bacterial growth rate is important. We think it's something more specific than that. So we've got our hypothesis that there's a folate threshold and that a low level of folate is required to support E. coli growth. It's nanomolar amounts, but above this threshold, Folate enables E. coli to shorten C. elegans lifespan. We're still working out that threat. You know, we found we were kind of finding ways to work out what the threshold is, and we're trying to understand what the key toxicities of E. coli are. But our model is basically that the excessive folate synthesis affects expression of genes that result in some sort of toxic activities that affect lifespan, and they also affect the aversion of the animals to the bacteria, which is something else that we see. One thing that we, we've, we've found is that we've found that it's in, 
important if we want to control certain things that we have to control the media that we grow the bacteria on. So the traditional C. elegans um, uh, experiments use peptone, which is a which is a, a crude extract of protein to grow bacteria. But we replace that with specific amino acids to have much more control over what we do. And we add trace metals and, and vitamin B12 and other things, and, and it allows us to do much more refined experiments. And using that, we can say that we can show that if we titrate PABA back into the media, we see that the ice band comes down and then it reaches a point where it comes back down to normal. So how do we apply this to, to human health? Well, we need to kind of look at whether there's evidence of folate synthesizing bacteria associated with disease. So we do know that mostly um, protein, you know, so some bacteria synthesize folate and some don't. Some require folate from their environment. They don't have the genes available to synthesize folate. Amongst the folate synthesizing bacteria are the gamma proteobacteria, such as E. coli, um, and some other pathogens who, so, so they potentially are associated with disease, but we don't know if it's the folate synthesizing capacity, how important that is. Um, sorry, so just a little um, diversion into thinking about how C. elegans works in the wild and how that affects the microbiome. So C. elegans is found in the wild in rotting vegetation, such as rotting apples, for example. So it's kind of su surrounded by microbes and they're a source of food. But really what's going on is that the, 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 the bacteria are eating the apple and the worms are eating the bacteria. So it's the way that they're extracting energy and, and nutrients from the apple. There's also danger though, because some bacteria can be harmful to C. elegans. So C. elegans has to work out what's, what's dangerous or what isn't. And, and by the same time, it's using the bacteria to extract energy from its food. And in a way, that's what we do as well, except instead of looking for rotting things, we, we keep all our bacteria within our, our gut, and that helps us extract nutrients from the diet, but obviously it requires a much more complex immune system and, and system to, to keep that safe. So as many of you will be fully aware, this is quite some, some old data, but back, gut bacteria can affect things such as obesity and some of the uh, early experiments from Jeffrey Gordon's lab showing that if you, if you transplant bacteria from obese mice into germ-free mice, you can cause obesity in those mice. So our collaborator, Li Ping Zhao, who's based in um, Shanghai, but also at Rutgers, he's put a cohort of um, patients onto a specific complex carbohydrate diet. And he looked for microbes that disappeared from those patients. And he cultured them. So one of them that he, he isolated was this, this um, Enterobacter cloacae B29 from one particular um, patient. And he, he put that into a germ-free mice mouse and found that that caused obesity in the presence of a high-fat diet. So the, you know, there's an, one of the models about how that works is that B29 produces LPS, which induces in inflammation within, the, within the, the host, and that's one way that obesity occurs. But what we tried to do was try to use C. elegans to understand this microbe. And we got some funding from the BBSRC, a UK-China partnership, and set up a, a, a lab in Shanghai. And this is my, my, my ex-PhD student, Bu Burke, uh, training Xiao Xin Wang, who was in that lab in Shanghai. And we found that on, and, and B29 grew well on our normal media. Um, and we found that worms on B29 had a very short lifespan. They also ha um, had a, a, a kind of sterility, the, 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 the worms had a kind of sterility and they also avoided that bacteria. And we found that all of these phenotypes could be um, prevented by treating the bacteria with SMX inhibiting folate synthesis. So that's, that was consistent with the idea that there was a kind of toxicity associated with this bacteria, which um, the worms could sense. Now this bacteria wasn't, isn't actually, you know, didn't, doesn't cause inflammation on itself in mice. It doesn't have a very pathogenic profile. So it's kind of interesting that the CLs are very sensitive to, to this bacteria and then we could, we could, um, um, stop that toxicity using 
um, the SMX drug. So does sulfonamides affect aging in mammals? Well, we don't know yet. We would love to do those experiments. Um, when we put a, an application to the patent office, they found this paper from 1958, which showed that um, the sul a sulfonamide, this is in the, uh, uh, developed by the Bayer Corporation, which was one of the original um, originators of sulfonamides. They showed that it caused increased lifespan in mice, rats, and even dogs. And this is, a, this is just a picture. That I just love this picture because, um, uh, I mean, it's a bit anecdotal and the, the background's changed and everything, but this is a mouse, this is mouse 99. The picture was taken on the 12th of December, 1957. And then after treatment with, uh, with this sulfonamide, um, a month later on the 14th of January, 1958, it's looking a lot better. So it, it, the, the study was pretty anecdotal, but, and, and then needs to be done again properly. But our work provides some sort of mechanism by how this may be working by the bacteria, and, and that's not how they were thinking at the time. So in terms of the, um, question, the folate story, you know, the questions to answer is, does inhibiting folate synthesis influence obesity, disease, and aging in mouse models? We'd love to do those experiments. Um, one particular uh, disease condition called, uh, called small intestine overgrowth is associated with the increase in serum folate levels. And so this is probably because there's um, it involves many proteobacteria colonizing the small intestine. And we don't know whether they're important for the disease, but it would be quite interesting to know if folate synthesis could help that. So it's something that we'd love to, to find out about. And, you know, maybe in, in cases, you know, where there's elevated levels of proteobacteria associated with disease, it might be that inhibitors of folate synthesis would be a logical target in those, in those conditions. So something else that we found out from this work when we tried to look at how um, a folic acid supplement works um, was that folic acid, which is different, which is an oxidized form of folate, it's used because it's much more stable than the, the reduced folates we found in nature. We find that folic acid um, doesn't go directly into the worm what happens is that it has spontaneous breakdown and it goes into bacteria using the ABGT transporter and broken down to, and then eventually broken down to PABA where it is resynthesized into folate and that folate then goes into the, into the worm. Now, this was quite interesting observation because we found that when we just took folic acid supplements from boots uh, and some other folic acid preparations that there was an endogenous amount of this breakdown product in this compound. So it's kind of interesting that, I mean, no one else had reported that before that this, pro this breakdown product was, um, was present in folic acid. And we don't know, understand the consequences of that, but it would be expected to be taken up by bacteria and used to synthesize folate. And that, and that might be perfectly fine and a great route to get it into the, to the body for, for, for many people, but there might be some people with particular health conditions with potential um, bacterial uh, overgrowth, for example, where that might be a bad thing. And it's kind of, you know, this is a, um, a snack that I've, I had on, on the plane to the US last year. And I noticed, as, as many of you know, in the US, um, folic acid is put into lots of different things, uh, um, including these um, cheesy snacks. And you'd imagine that there's bound to be plenty of breakdown in the, in the manufacture of these, of these snacks. And one thing that we found was that folic acid in, increased the folate levels in bacteria. It was through this ABGT route, um, but it, it was quite interesting how the, the effect it had. So it would be interesting to know what the effect is on the microbiome. And that's something that we're kind of looking into now with, in, with, in, with the collaboration. So, you know, this is, you know, we kind of want to understand whether or not um, Decreasing bacterial folate synthesis improves health markers in mammals. Are there safe inhibitors of folate synthesis that can dampen bacterial toxicity? Do the folate precursor from folic acid supplements affect health? And can we identify specific bacterial products through this 
um, that cause aging and disease throughout our way of looking at this through our system. And so that brings us on to magnitude biosciences. Um, we are a, effectively we're a CRO that's uniquely um, set up and to, to work with C. elegans. Um, and it's a team that's come out of our university group, but, but um, ha, 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 brings together a whole bunch of different expertises from physics, from business, uh, from so on. So, so, that, so it really came from the aging field, that this, the ideas behind magnitude biosciences. So, um, you know, to understand aging, you need, aging is intrinsically variable. Even though we could predict the aging of a population, of individuals, um, age in different ways and so you need very well controlled experiments of large numbers of individuals and, and doing this kind of experiments with mice is very slow and expensive. Now C. elegans have been shown to be very um, relevant to aging in, in, in human aging a number of the a number of the things that have worked in C. elegans have shown to be work in mouse models and potentially they enable testing of drugs before going to mice. It's fast, but the manual methods are limiting. Doing a lifespan experiment is kind of slow and tedious uh, and, very, and, and requires high, high amount of training. So we were interested more on health rather than death. You know, why is it that Rogers Federer is still playing tennis rather than the death rate? Um, and so we've come up with technology, and this is just an early prototype in this picture, but um, the, the focus is on looking at early life and a early life to middle age decline in movement that we see with the worms and to monitor them continually and non-invasively. So we don't have to do tests on them. We're just watching those worms. And we also really, you know, the technology made us really understand how important it was to get our preparation right. So reproducible and precise worm preparation um, using um, quality management system principles, but just, which is effectively just, you know, making sure that we've got a lot of consistency and, um, and we have, you know, clear guidelines and checkpoints for that, that, that allows us to get really, really good data. And so um, we don't, unlike other technologies in the worm field, we don't track every single individual and we don't worry about the exact time of death. We're, what we're looking at is to get really good quality data on how the worm slowed down. And, and, and produce it with a professional standard. So we provide certain metrics about our worm populations that we, you know, we, we protect them. We, we, can, we can tell people about the number of moving worms. We can, we can have data on the speed of the worms and the position of the worms. So I'm gonna give you a little um, demonstration with this video. So this is a video where we're looking at a a strain of E. coli, uh, sorry, a strain of C. elegans, which has a transgene that um, makes it express the, the amyloid beta peptide found in Alzheimer's disease. And so on the right here, you can see how the worms are moving and you can see in the red is where they've moved already. And then in this graph here, we can see the fraction of time that each is moving at any particular point. And that allows us to kind of get a picture of how the worm movement declines with time. And you can, so the control worms, so when we put the worms on, we put them as um, L4s, which is, oh, sorry, I knew this was what happened. I'll skip back to where we were, about here. I'm oh, really sorry about this. So, sorry. I might have to just leave this. So, so we, we start them off at uh, a, a quite a young age and then they, they, uh, day one, they reach adulthood and that adulthood they're moving uh, uh, as, as fast as they are and they kind of plateau there for a couple of days. And then after a few days, they decline. The amount of movement they, they, they do decline. Now the Alzheimer's model worms decline much, much faster, but eventually the the control worms also decline just within the space of a few days. And we can measure that and we can integrate those curves to get a kind of average time of the average time moving or the average mean health span. And that gives us very quantitative and, and good data that we can look at. And we, the other the point is, is that we can look at 
many, many plates at once. And so we have our, our numbers are very large. So um, here is an, um, some data that we did for a particular customer where we looked at a, you know, here we have 770 animals per condition. And we're looking at how they slow down with age. And we see that there's a very clear decline with age, but the, the drug that, that we're using here um, increases the amount of mobility and movement in a very clear, statistically significant way. So what about um, the work, going back to the work with further instances and SMX, we find that we can get very sensitive data on SMX by uh, using a concentration series. We can see that we can increase the amount of time that these animals stay, stay active and we get very fine data at, at concentrations that are, that are very difficult to detect. Um, significant differences just using the traditional lifespan assay. So it shows you how sensitive and quantitative our data is. And we can also get really great movement data so we can get a kind of distribution of how the movement of the worms changes with time and how adding this compound allows the worms to stay active for much longer. So how can we maybe use this to find active molecules within the microbiome? Well, this is a potential assay that we're, that we're, we're talking about doing with, with our system. So we've shown that if you treat E. coli with SMX, you can keep them healthier for longer. And we can find that if we take a, a, um, a supernatant of this, that we can suppress that movement effect. And so one thing then we could do is, you know, is to chemically characterize and concentrate this extract and find you know find out some basics of about solubility and so on um and find and find conditions where we get a very strong effect and then we can use chromatography to do fractionation of this of of, of this um you know extract or supernatant and that and, and then each fraction we can test using our health span assay so we can look for how each fraction affects health span and you know, and then we can narrow down on to, to understand what molecules are. Obviously, each fraction is going to have hundreds, and you know, as anyone's ever done in sort of fractionation, knows that each fraction will have hundreds of molecules. But we can then, you know, as we scale this up, we could we could then get down to smaller molecules or test particular candidates. So it gives us a way to have a functional readout of very specific bacterial metabolites or proteins or, or excreted peptides, for example. So how, what potential projects could you do with magnitude biosciences? Well, these are just some ideas um, that we have, but this is the kind of thing we would like to discuss with anyone who's interested. Um, so for example, if you've got a specific bacteria that you're interested in, I mean, we can't work with completely obligate anaerobes because C. elegans need some oxygen to survive, but we can work with many other bacteria. So, and people have shown that several different types of bacteria can be used um, with C. elegans. So with optimized conditions for the specific bacteria or combinations of bacteria, people have also done that work with C. elegans, um, uh, which I can refer people to. And then we can see whether we can get a system working out with your bacteria of choice. Then we could test particular drug interventions in, in that C. elegans bacteria system. Or we could take particular bacterial products, as, as I've kind of explained, um, in that in that system, and we could use we could identify bacterial products using fractionation and, and analytical biochemistry. Um, once we kind of get down to some of those bacterial products, we could use inhibitors or bacterial genetics to knock out relevant genes to produce uh, to block production of the bioactive compounds to test whether they're affecting the health of, of the worm. And once we identify molecules, we could compare them with microbiome data sets to see which are maybe associated with disease. Uh, or, or particular conditions to, to try and understand and find sets of biomarkers that could be helped to, to track that disease in, in, in humans. And of course, as we want, would like to do with the, the folate stories, we can then conduct appropriate mouse experiments or human studies to follow that on. And, and obviously this is just one technology, as I said before, in, in, in the armory of the microbiome system. There's other things such as in vitro microbiomes um, 
you know, um, different, different other, many other different systems really um, that, that, that you, 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 may, you may be involved in yourself. So I kind of see that it's a kind of partnership on different scales. You know, we can take things that are found in, from human studies and test them in worms. And likewise, we can find things that we found in the C. elegans system and, and bring them up and test them in, in, in people. We, we know that microbiome search is a highly interdisciplinary subject. It's really important, things like this KTN group and other, other, other um, forums are really important to have these kind of discussions. And we're kind of trying to just kind of work out the best way that we can help uh, and we can help you um, in, in your you know, quest for looking at ways to you know, improve health via the microbiome. So these are the, the people that have helped with the research and so on, and our funders. And um, please talk to us. This is, this is a picture of, of, of Fred Tholazan. Um, this is a poster that she was supposed to be presenting in France in, in, in mid-March, which was unfortunately cancelled because of COVID. So this is her presenting it in her living room. And, um, and this is what we're all doing now. So, but please uh, email us and, and, um, and we can talk about things. But also, of course, if you've got any questions now, I'd really be happy to answer any. Thanks. Right. Uh, thank you so much, David. Um, I'm sure. I'm sure there's lots of uh, clapping and uh, applause and <laughs> at everybody's home home screens. Um, just a quick question for you. Um, so, as I said, this is recorded and we'll provide it to everybody later. Um, potentially, we could uh, provide some links to those videos. I don't know if you have them on your website or or yeah. if potentially we could get the presentation so people can watch them on their home computers as well. Uh, yes, yes, yes. We do. We we can do that. And we yes, and some of those videos are on our website. But yes, we can make sure that they're available. Yeah, we're happy to share all this, this presentation. Great. Um, so uh, if it's all right, we're going to dive into some questions. I can see um, Andrew Morgan has already uh, clicked the green box and popped to the, in the top of my screen. So I'll, I'll unmute him in a moment. If anybody else wants to queue up to have a conversation with David, feel free. So Andrew, I'm going to unmute you now and, and you can ask a question and have a bit of a discussion. Oh, my screen change here. Just bear with. There we I go. The sharing is that okay? Charles? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That's okay. Yeah. Andrew, you're unmuted now. Great. Okay. Thank you. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes. I can hear you. Hi, hi David. Thank you very Hi. much for that great presentation. Very interesting. Um, I don't know too much about C. elegans. I have to confess. So, can can you say something about the gut anatomy and and and, and, and sort of a, a, a natural microbiota that might exist, or is it just a, a sort of monoculture once you start feeding on E. coli or whatever? Um, just to get, get some understanding of of whether it's, it could be a good model to study uh, microbiome interventions. Right. So, um, so the. The, the gastrointestinal tract of C. elegans is just a, a simple tube. It, it starts off with a, a, a pharynx, so the, the, it's kind of the mouth, and then that pumps and pumps up the E. coli, the e. coli or whatever bacteria, uh, grinds them up as much as possible, um, and then it goes through this tube, and then out the other end, they've got a 50 second defecation cycle. Um, <laughs> so there's a quite, you know, which so is quite a, a, a lot a fast passage, but it is shown that some bacteria survive the, the grinder. And there's quite a lot of people that are, are studying the kind of natural microbiome of C. elegans in the wild. And it does seem to be that some quite strong evidence that there are bacteria that kind of reside more than others. Now, in the lab, in our, this most experiments that we do, we, like you say, we just put C. elegans on a monoculture because it kind of keeps it simpler and allows us to see that simple interaction. But there, mm. there, could, there are labs such as, um, you know, um, there's a guy called Buck Samuel who's been pioneering this, is, who's been putting together a, a, a collection of 12 microbes that, that seem to exist together and work together in C. elegans. Um, and, 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 and so there's are people that are, are working on those kind of systems. It does obviously increase the complexity, but it is possible to do that. But I think the strength really is that really clear monoculture where we can do genetics on, 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 the, on the bacteria and really see clear mm. effects. Mm. Right, right. And, and just a sort of an ancillary question. Um, is, is there an interaction, a known interaction between the, the, the sort of the natural gut microbiota and, and the immune system of the worm? And is, is, could that be a, 
some kind of useful model for studying um, microbiome interventions? So um, the worms don't have an adaptive immune, immune system, mm -hmm. but they do have an innate, innate immune system, right. you know, like, yes. like we do. Mm -hmm. um, and there is an interaction between the innate immune system and the bacteria. A number mm -hmm. of people have, have studied that. So, so yes, there is a, a, a certain level, some possibilities for doing that. But in some ways, it, um, it also takes out some of the, you know, the immune system is a very complex thing. And, and it, you know, it, it maybe takes out some of the complexity of that to a certain extent as well, because we can kind of see directly how the bacteria affect that, the cells of the, and the functioning of the animal. Right, right. Okay. Well, thank you very much, David. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Andrew and, and David. I'm going to mute you now again, Andrew. Um, so we don't have anybody else who so far has, has uh, wanted to speak, but I'll, I'll take a couple of questions from the chat for you, David. So first off, a uh, question from Scott Harrison. Um, have you measured DNA methylation versus folate level and how that relates to aging? Um, well, actually, in C. elegans, we, you don't see the same CPG DNA methylation that you see in, in humans. So what you see is um, histomethylation. Um, instead, there's a kind of way that it affects um, the, the, the chromatin. We haven't yet looked at how folate levels affect histomethylation. That's something that we'd, we'd like to do, but um, no, no, we haven't done that yet. Great, thank you. And here's another question um, from Maria. Uh, will your system be able to trace animals that do not move a lot. So I think she means specific animals and then eventually look for kind of suppressors of locomotion or defects in those kind of uh, those animals. So, so yes, I mean, we basically set up our system and the time scale that works for the kind of wild type normally moving C. elegans. I think what Maria's talking about is particular models in C. elegans, some mm -hmm. new neurogenitive models that don't move as much as the normal ones and so yes we could do that by just changing the kind of time scale that we look at those animals um, and then looking for suppressors of locomotion defects yes we can we can do that because we are very sensitive you know everyone can see worm the thing that i didn't really get into was that worms are like humans we don't in that we don't they don't move all the time some move some of the, you know we don't all move all the time if you looked at most of us now we're pretty stationary it doesn't mean that we're aging well we are aging but it doesn't mean that we're you know we're not functional it's just that we just sat in front of a computer screen as we have been for days on end so um so you have to kind of like look at them continually to see their uh, total you know so we might not be moving now but we'll move faster when it's time for lunch you know so we 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 can see we can by monitoring the worms kind of all the time we can see very subtle changes in worm movement that you can't see using other techniques. And so even if the subtle suppressors of, 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 of movement defects, we can see that. We can really quantitatively see how movement changes with time, if that makes sense. Great, thank you. Um, do we have any other questions uh, for David before we wrap up? And just to say also, um, you know, we can put you in touch with David afterwards if there's things that you don't want to ask publicly as well. Uh, we have one more from Maria. How many animals are needed for such an assay? Um, uh, for example, the one shown for amyloid beta. So that assay, if I get this correct, was with 150 animals for each condition. And so it was five plates of 30 worms each. Um, we can do it with a bit less than that, but the more worms you have, the better. Um, so that's kind of about numbers. I mean, in terms of like, you know, people getting in touch and stuff, please do so. Um, and, and if there's, you know, if really we want to know what your issues are in, in the microbiome field. Is there a way that we can adapt what we're doing to fit what you're trying to achieve, really? And so that's, that's really, you know, one of the great things of being able to talk to such a wide range of people. Right. Yeah. And, and uh, as we said, um, we'll provide... A recording of this and um, as much other kind of information as far as links etc um, afterwards that you can find online reach out to myself or David directly if, if you have his email if you you know if you do have questions 
And um, I, I think that wraps it up. So uh, a big thank you to you, David, for sharing. Um, very, very interesting. Um, and, and I hope uh, lots of people reach out with questions and maybe to form partnerships as well. Um, and you have some thank yous coming through, through on chat. And for everybody who came and listened today, thank you so much. Um, let me know if you have any suggestions for other things you'd want to hear, if you want to be the next victim and, and share with the community. I think David would tell you it's not, not too painful, I hope, I hope. Nice. And uh, yeah, otherwise, um, stay in touch and, and stay safe for the remaining time. And, and please do uh, get in touch if you have questions. So thank you, David. And thank you, everybody, for joining us today. I'll end the webinar now. Thanks, thanks Charles. Thanks, everybody.